welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show we're really excited you're here you know we have this exploration of the digital aspect mm -hmm. of all things i mean wendy adams cfre goddess extraordinaire is with us <laughs> as we chat with heather hammonds fundraising coach from chance to win hey, hey heather welcome to the show hi julia hi wendy how are y'all great doing good you know we're excited to have you on this episode because wendy and i talk a lot about fundraising mm -hmm. but then we're like squeezing in this new umbrella of the mm -hmm. digital nature of things and so to enter this conversation with you and really structure it with the online um, concept is really going to be exciting and so we're we're really interested in what you have to say heather um before we get going i want to make sure that we give a shout out of gratitude to our presenting sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader fundraisers friday our new episode every friday and your part-time controller um Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I'm here with Wendy Adams, CFRE. Wendy, my friend, I've missed you this summer. I know, Julia. I cannot believe it's been so long, but so excited to be back. You know, Wendy is like the woman, the international woman of mystery, because you were in uh, a family home in St. Kitts. Yes. Um, wow. For wow. Yeah. <laughs> battling all of that comes with that down in that area of the world this time of year. But it was a great time to be with family. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that when you uh, leave your environment and then come back, you probably come back with some gems and some, mm -hmm. you know, mind opportunities and, and uh, reflection. And so um, we're going to have to learn more from you about what's been cooking in your world. But Wendy F. Adams, CFRE one of the amazing minds of our co-host panels. Um, our panelists come to us from all different parts of the country. And so with them, they bring this amazing, um, I guess, Wendy, I want to say like regional flair, even, uh, even I noticed it with vocabulary and yes. accents, um, cadence, like how fast we speak. It's just riveting to me. Um, and so I, I, lo I love things like that, but Wendy being one of our um, co-hosts is just a, a thrill for me. So I hope you've been able to get to meet some of our other co-hosts. And now we get to meet Heather Hammonds, fundraising coach for Chance to Win. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Well, we're thrilled. We have so many questions. We have so many things we want to talk about. Um, Talk to us about Chance to Win. What What is Chance to Win? So Chance to Win is an online raffle platform company that serves the fundraising needs of charities and nonprofits across the country. Wow. How long have you been in business? Is this something that started prior to the pandemic or is this a, a more new mm. thing? Very long. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Online fundraising has actually been around for a very, very long time, way before the pandemic. Actually, um, our company started in the late 90s. I've been with the company for about five years now, but people began to hear more about online fundraising and began to search for online fundraising a lot more during the pandemic, whenever the in-person events got shut down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what a confluence of opportunity and time. I mean, Wendy, don't you think that those folks that had started to even recognize online uh, fundraising, I, I'm going to start even at the basics, like where they had digital bid, bidding paddles and on-site digital component were ready, not ready to go, but more inclined to keep going during the pandemic? Well, absolutely, because we were at that point where everything was shutting down, but this could keep us engaged. This could keep us, what we always say, making it easy to give. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm excited to learn more about from Heather today. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> really, really cool. Well, let's get into it. Um, this is like the bane of any fundraiser's <laughs> existence. Um, and I wanna man up and say, it's really tough because event ticket management, a lot of times 
event management, let's just call it out, <clears throat> falls into the lap of the fundraisers when they yeah. are not really event managers by training. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about this, this <clears throat> ecosystem, if you will. Right. So you know what it's like, it sounds like, to run a fundraiser, to have mm -hmm. to handle those little paper tickets, you know, the square ones that you only have one of usually that you give out to the person and you hope they don't lose it because <laughs> you didn't write that number down yet. Well, <laughs> with online fundraising, that ticket number is automatically generated for that customer, emailed directly to them and put into a file into reporting for you online. So if that customer says, oh, I gave you the wrong email address, you can hop right in there, update their email address and resend them their ticket number. It's easy. You don't have to wonder what ticket number you gave them. You know, you don't have to wonder about giving someone a duplicate ticket number now because the system mm -hmm. just does it for you. OK, already I'm like, Whew. what? <laughs> Keep this ticket. I don't know where it is. <laughs> it's the worst. Well, and you know what? I'm going to I'm going to say this too because I'm older than both of you ladies, but I've noticed that as I've aged and you know you're you're always in like a, a darkened ballroom mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. and then you can't see them. Right. You know, or you can't read the handwriting. Or you can handwrite. Yeah. Them. Or they gave you half their phone number. <laughs> yeah. Right. There's nothing worse. And, and I do emceeing work and I have over the years and you get up on stage and you have the bowl and you, you know, swirl it around <laughs> and then you pull out the tickets and then you're like kind of holding it up to the other people on the stage saying, can you, mm -hmm. can you tell what this says? Or, oh, yeah. it's the worst or it's absolutely, it's um, super uncomfortable. Yeah, it, it is. And it also takes away from why we're there. Yeah, like right in the middle of all of that. Now we've got this shift and it drops the climax it. of it all, yes. you know? Yeah. Well, now imagine that you don't have to worry about the number because you went back to the system that has all your ticket numbers stored and you digitally selected a winner. So now it displays the winner's first and last name along with their ticket number for you right on your screen or your laptop. So then you don't even have to worry or guess or wonder who it is. Wow. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> I've got to believe that that, um, as Wendy said, it, it gets you through that process so mm -hmm. that it allows you to move on to the next piece of what it is you're doing, yes. uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that you're not fumbling with that whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about, uh, and again, we have so many questions for you. <laughs> But talk to us a little bit about donor reports and mm -hmm. the data management. This is such a big topic. Mm -hmm. um, I know Wendy's shaking her head. It's like we talk about this more and more, Wendy, across the board, don't you think? No matter what yeah. the topic is. That's not analytics, analytics, analytics. What do we do with it? Yeah. Right. It's because they're the ones that are in, they're interested in your cause. They're supporting your cause. You need to know who those people are. You need to be able to reach back out to those people. That's something you usually tr you usually miss in traditional raffle sales. Whenever you're in those halls and you're taking $5 for a ticket, you might not have gotten their information or they might not actually know what they're supporting. But whenever you do it online, they land on your page. They see who you guys are. And then when they check out, you've got all their information. You can actually also ask them how they heard about the events. So that's one more piece of information that you guys can gather to know like how the word is getting out, something you've missed, you know, traditionally. Right. Well, Heather, right. you're talking about another touch point. Mm -hmm. That's just another touch point with them. <clears throat> Fantastic. Yeah, really interesting. You know, um, Heather, while we've got you on this this connecting point with data and the information, um, it seems to me that you have folks that will buy that one-off ticket with with a group just because they're standing outside of a grocery store or or something like that versus you're checking into a gala or you're checking into a community breakfast or lunch and then it's a little bit more structured where does that fit on the spectrum when we're talking about the digital nature like how are we going to be able to market and share this information with people who already love us and support us. Right. Great question. So usually with the online raffle websites, most of them with chance to win, you create a URL that's unique to your event. 
So it's special, it's dedicated to you. You can post that onto your current website. Um, you can post that in all of your social channels. You can text it to anybody and you can even pop it in an email campaign. So now you can, you can reach anyone any way with your raffle link, with your event link, and then they can enter, they can purchase, they can check out, and you haven't had to leave your house. Mm -hmm. Okay, really interesting. I've got one more question that kind of dovetails into that. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me, and, and, and I broadcast from Phoenix, um, Wendy broadcasts from Virginia, correct? Wendy, yes. you're in Virginia yeah, right now. I am. Um, so in the state of Arizona, if you operate a raffle, mm -hmm. technically you're supposed to go through the same uh, agency, state agency that moderates the the the, the uh, state lottery system, mm -hmm. which is a big scandal. Most people, I mean, from churches to schools, they have no idea because right. holding a raffle is like one of the first and foremost, you know, uh, fundraising. Yeah, that we, right. we grew up with as kids. There's rules. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk to us about mm. that data point and that measurement aspect um, of um, what you see from state to state? So while I can't speak on actual legalities to states or offer any legal advice because I'm not a lawyer and you wouldn't want me to off give you legal advice anyways, I can tell you that each state does usually have their own rules and regulations that are posted on their state's. Um, gambling websites, like you said, Arizona has. If a state does require that you're only allowed to sell tickets in a certain state or a certain area, there are ways that you that we can geonet your raffle site to where only people from that specific state can check out. Or if you're not allowed to accept credit card payments for raffle sales in your state, like Montana has, um, we're able to put a pop-up and put disclaimers on the site and you're able to put that only debit cards can be used to check out on that raffle site. So there are some checkpoints in place that we can add to help people with those rules and regulations that they have that are sometimes very, very specific. Okay, that blows my mind. So <laughs> so you're telling us then each state can be pretty ding dang different. Yep, oh, absolutely, 100%. <laughs> are you and by county by too. <laughs> not just state, it could go down to the county level. Wow. There are some states that operate their fundraising permits and everything at the county level. It's not even at the state level. Oh. I, I did. Did you know that, Wendy? No. <laughs> I've never, I, I had never heard that. So then what is the, is it still a good opportunity to, to open up across this country when you have so many regulations or what do you, what are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. So we do operate across the state because the majority of fundraising can be done across the state. There are some states in our country are, that do not allow their residents to participate in online. Sure, you know that the people who are using Chance to Win aren't offering it up to states who have already said we don't allow our residents. Mm. Those laws can change anytime we get notified by the state when those laws change, so it's, it's fluid, it's always changing. But as soon as we know that a state doesn't allow or a state is reallowing, we either remove or add a state back. Wow, okay, so Wendy, this is a fascinating um, twist on things. I mean, you're the fundraising <laughs> expert and guru. Just off the top of your head, what do you think is the percentage of people that know this in the fundraising world, in the nonprofit sector? Oh, that even, even these, that, that there are even regulations. That the, yeah, not even how mine, yeah. uh, mm, mm, under 20%. Yeah. I would have said uh, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Cause this girl didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. because you don't know because you've been yeah. fundraising since, you remember going to school and fundraising and everyone does it in school cafeterias or in the churches mm -hmm. at spaghetti dinners and nobody really thinks that there's any laws required into fundraising but there there actually are very many wow so talk about this then along those lines when we're thinking about uh, you know our school cafeteria and mm -hmm. holy moly <laughs> You took me back and then through the trajectory of my child's life and my, our niece's lives. I mean, it's the school cafeteria. 
Mm-hmm. Right. I, I'm like right there. It's the dry drop off when you take the kids to school or pick them up. And so then you hear the word, oh, my gosh, larger reach. The grandparents mm-hmm. that live out of state, the family members, just anybody. Um, how does that work? And should we be thinking about this in a different way? So, for example, if we open up out of state, are we looking at a, a 10% amount of growth or 20 or 50 or mm-hmm. do you have any sense of that? Well, you're definitely going to be looking at a larger growth because now you've expanded your audience to people that never before would have seen it. And now your child doesn't have to, or as my mom used to have to do in the past, she would have to take my flyers to work and persuade <laughs> all of her coworkers to buy chocolate from me. <laughs> I don't have to do that with my kids because I could just share it on Facebook and then my family across the country can enter or even my neighbor down the street who I never would have even have thought would have supported my child will enter because it was easy and they were able to click on it. Yeah, too. You know, so your reach is automatically going to be expanded just because there are people out there that really would support you that maybe you don't even think of sometimes and it's so easy to share it, so easy to enter. Mm-hmm. We're, I mean, I just am picturing the QR code, right? Oh, That's yeah. It. Here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you make that, put it on a flyer, you're done. Pop it on a door. I have a lady um, who does a church carnival raffle, and she puts mm-hmm. a QR code on her car and drives around town and <laughs> asks people to buy tickets. <laughs> oh, my God, I love that attitude. Um, let's drill down a little bit. What is that sweet spot for... Mm. Um, for the, the dollar amount. Um, mm-hmm. Wendy, I don't know about you, but in my community, I've been seeing that number go up, like, you know, $100, $500, and then capping it, saying we're going to only sell so many tickets, but that they're at a higher amount. Do you mm-hmm. have a sense of, of that, Heather? Like, what what's going on? So it really all depends on the kind of raffle y'all are trying to run or the raffle that the charity is trying to run. If it's a vehicle raffle for a brand new vehicle, then that's when we traditionally see a higher one dollar, like one entry level price. And then they're limited because people kind of want to know their odds on that high dollar price. If it's a basket raffle or if it's a 50 50 raffle, there are never usually any tickets capped because you want to maximize your sales. You don't want to limit yourself on what you're going to sell. You could leave a lot of money on the table by saying you're only going to sell a thousand tickets. Yeah. Um, but picking your price point, that's going to all determine on your demographic, what you think your demographic can afford. You don't want to overprice your tickets and then your own community can't enter. So mm-hmm. that's just something that you need to pay attention to in your area, you know. Mm-hmm. Wendy, do you have thoughts on this? Like, what do I you do? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you said it really well, Julia, because even in the cases of a 50 50, which you don't want to cap, you want everybody in. That entry point has stepped up. And now I've seen tickets at $10 to get mm-hmm. in. We're back yeah. and you know, you would pay for a dollar or three yeah. for five. Yeah. But now you are getting in with your with your $10 ticket. And it and people are not moved by that. They're doing it. They're pulling that out. Again, when you make it also easy and they're not actually pulling out physical dollars, that has also changed the fact mm-hmm. of. Yeah. Right. Well, and it I, also helps them know, it helps, I'm sorry to step on. No, it also no. is like a better to have a higher ticket price when you do something online as well, because the charity is going to be incurring a processing fee from the credit yes. card processor. So it's best to either raise your dollar amount to what it was traditionally in person or just add a service fee on the checkout page, which most people aren't, you know, harmed at, you know, they don't really mind if there's going to be a service fee. You pay that for movie tickets, you know, so but you got to make sure you're not leaving money on the table that way too by like you said Wendy a $1 ticket online that's not going to make you any money at all you won't and the winner won't win any money at all because you're not going to make a lot you know right right do you feel like the and and this is for both of you ladies mm. do you feel that the 50/50 raffles are picking up um attention and more i mean I first saw them at sporting events when, you know, an NFL team or MLB or even NHL team would um, then 50% went to their philanthropic group, their, their charity. Mm -hmm. um, And then the other 50 went to whomever won. Are, Are you seeing this more or not? Yes, absolutely. Because you don't have to secure a prize. The prize is as big as the participation. And I think that's it. 
that's it. We go back to what's easy. And so mm -hmm. it's easy for those who are participating, the organization itself. I'm seeing it with civic groups across. All. That's where I'm seeing that increase. And I want to say resurgence because it's been there and it's mm -hmm. coming back again with those higher entry amounts. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So in the digital world, are you kind of, I'm assuming that, that you would like open this, we'll just use the example of the 50-50 raffle early, mm -hmm. get the sales, yes. and then the winner is announced at an event, like say the annual gala, or what's your, what does that time mm. continuum look like? Yeah. So we recommend that you give yourself at least two weeks on a raffle. That way you give yourself enough time to generate traction. If you want to go a month before your drawing is going to take place, then that's even better because that gives the audience more time to enter. Maybe they need to have another pay period hit before they can, you know, allow themselves $10 to enter. Who knows? But it gives you more time to raise funds. With most 50-50 raffles and like the ones that we have, you have a pot that generates the total with every new entry that grows on the page. So you might even have people that come back multiple times because they're going to see that that pot's getting bigger. When it, when it gets to $5,000, you see a lot more people start entering too. So yes, and then to say that the winner is going to be announced live at the, at the event, that's usually the best way to do it. And that's how a lot of charities love to do it. Okay, you said something fascinating and Wendy, you're kind of giggling. I have been part of that where I'm thinking of a, a baseball game um, and uh, in our stadium, in my community, the 50-50 pot is is on the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. And so then you you go in and you, you know, you're, you're getting your hot dog and your beverage and everything and you spend whatever amount you're gonna spend. And then throughout the evening, nine innings can be a long time you see that number go up and then you're like i'm always like to my husband oh jeff we need to buy more because look at what it's up at it's so i never thought of it until you mentioned that yeah and you do probably usually buy more because when you see that the prize is going to be bigger you're like oh i'll buy more at least if i buy more i'm still going to win it back right that's your mentality yeah oh my god that's hilarious okay that's really interesting and and i i appreciate you calling that out let's talk about this and you mentioned this briefly in the beginning and that's the paperless and digital um, record aspect you mentioned this in the very beginning and a lot of times we sell raffle tickets we have no idea who they were sold to we don't track it mm -hmm. what are we missing here you're missing everything you're missing future contact you're missing future engagement you're you're missing a lot you're missing a lot by having those donor reports, you don't also have to keep track of all these spreadsheets or all these little pieces of paper where you jot down it, jot down, jotted down John's name with his ticket number. You can just log in, you can download your, your report, you can see how many new tickets were sold that day, and then you can log out. You're also kind of saving the planet because you're not printing out a bunch of paper that you don't need. You just hop in, you see your updates, you log out, you're good. At the end of your event, you download all of your reports, you sort them by how you need, so you can see, this is another thing you're missing out on. On your reports, you can see was the five ticket package that was priced a little bit lower mm -hmm. than buying individually, that one was more popular. So we'll definitely do that next year. Nobody liked this, we're not gonna do that one next year. So you're missing so much. Yeah. I, go ahead, Wendy, I think I- Well, I was just gonna say, you've also opened up people who don't actually attend the event, but participated, you know, prior to they gave and we didn't have any information necessarily. And, but now we've added this additional layer of supporters that we can actually engage with beyond the event. And they didn't even step foot in the door. Right. Yeah. That's magical because I think that's one yeah. of the things is that we, you know, if you're just preaching to the choir, as they say, you know, the, the 400, if, if you get that many in your ballroom <laughs> or whatever, even if you get a thousand people in your ballroom, um, that's only a thousand people. Right. And you have the four hours to make it or break it. And then it goes away until next year. And it, it's, it's a brutal thing to mm -hmm. lose that connectivity. Um, and it's so frightening because that's, 
the basis of how we navigate our nonprofit business, right? Exactly. I mean, it's a really frightening thing. Um, do you portend, you know, action on on raffles and that they're going to get bigger and that we're going to be re-engaging with this or because it's, okay. it's like an old school thing that <laughs> it seems like it's come back or, or it's it's newer and more exciting because of the digital age is that is that fair to say yeah i think so i think that you're going to start seeing a lot more people doing raffles online just because it's a lot easier a lot of people are going back to a way busier lifestyle these days you know, they don't have time to sit around and keep reports and follow up with a lot of things. It's easier to set it and go watch progress, you know, spread the word online, do minimal work with maximum effort uh, or minimal. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, yeah, you're going to start seeing a lot more. We actually at Chance to Win, we just released a new online version of a raffle called the Queen of Hearts raffle. And I'm not sure if any of you guys have ever heard of that one, but it's a traditionally in-person raffle that's now going to be completely online. So I think a lot of people are going to be doing a lot, a lot of online raffles now for all their fundraising. So talk to us about uh, how a Queen of Hearts mm -hmm. raffle works, because I don't know about it. No, it's a progressive style raffle with a 50-50 pot. So you have a deck of 52 cards with two jokers. So there's 54 cards. So each week supporters will buy tickets and then all the cards are face down on the board and you have to buy cards, tickets for cards that you think have the queen of hearts. So let's say you'll buy tickets for cards number four and cards number 54 at the end of the week when the card is drawn, if it is not the queen of hearts, then all of the tickets are discarded and you everything rolls again to the next week until the queen of hearts is found. The raffle could go for three weeks. The raffle could go for 50 weeks. It's all until the queen of hearts is found. Wow. <laughs> okay. I have to think about that because that sounds kind of fun. <laughs> and no, it's really fun. And you get to watch all the cards as they're revealed, like show up on the digital board. It tells you when the last card was pulled. It, yeah, it's really fun. Wow. You know, we don't have much time, but before we let you go, um, is it ever a good idea to run a raffle outside of your normal um, mm. gala season or your, you know, like mm. make the raffle its own event? Or do you feel like it should always be tagged to an event? Um, so it kind of depends. I know that some, a lot of animal shelters don't really have like big events that they can work towards, but they like to do a raffle. So they do a lot of Facebook live events, not actually like events like mm -hmm. galas that people can attend, but it is usually nice to work around something that people get excited about. But even the raffle itself can be its own event to be excited about. If you promote the prizes as, you know, an exciting thing, it is its own event. And if you do have prizes that were donated to you, then yes, I do think it's a good idea to try to operate that raffle outside of your season because it's something different and you might catch a new demographic. Maybe people this time of year would be able to enter where versus another time of the year, they might be more strapped for cash. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a really interesting way to look at it. And, and certainly based on where, what your service level is and where you are. And, and uh, you know, Wendy, I'm thinking about communities that are small. Mm -hmm. Well, you have, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I mean, you said it earlier, Julia. So communities that are small, organizations that are small, and you've got a one woman, one man shop. So now you've got this fundraiser who has to do it all. Mm -hmm. This allows for them to be able to actually do their job and participate or get their, their supporters to participate. You know, I was that fundraiser who also in a previous life was an <laughs> event manager. So when once my employer found that out, I got double duty, but this would have tremendously, mm -hmm. you know, taken it to, to the next level. Uh, but for those who don't have that skill, I see this as being a tremendous um, benefit and mm -hmm. asset for sure. Yeah. Really interesting. Well, Heather Hammonds, we're so excited that you joined us today. Heather Hammonds, a fundraising coach at Chance to Win. You can check out their site, Chance Number Two win.org and you can learn about how they organize and structure th this digital raffle environment and uh, opportunity very very interesting and as we go into you know this final stretch of fundraising 
Um, this is a great time to have this conversation, isn't it, Wendy? It absolutely is the most wonderful time of the year. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think that's a great way to look at it. Hey, another great thing to look at are our sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that are joining us day in and day out so we can spread the word about the nonprofit sector. You know, Wendy, we've done nearly 1,200 episodes. You've been a big part of it. And uh, we're in our fifth year now. So we have a lot of uh, content. Our archives are full. And uh, you can always join us and learn more about the things and the thoughts that will help you succeed with your nonprofit. Well, ladies, this has been great. I've really enjoyed it. I've learned some new things today. Awesome. And I want to leave with this message. And that is to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, ladies.